This is what the end of a honeybee stinger looks like under an electron microscope. Notice those wicked backward-facing barbs. Here's an animated diagram of the entire stinger. Muscles, venom sac, venom pumps, and all. When you look at this, you might be thinking, no way, that's fake. Surely a bee stinger isn't this complex, right? Today we'll compare this diagram to actual footage of honeybee stingers, footage like this right here, and we'll look at several high-resolution images taken with electron microscopes. Stated Clearly presents... Exactly how do bee stingers work? I've noticed that many people fear honeybees. The phobia is so common, it has its own official name, melissophobia. Mel is Latin for honey. In my opinion, this fear, for the most part, is unwarranted. Bees are very gentle little critters. Even though they can sting, they usually only do so if you attack them first, if you accidentally smash one, or if they think you're trying to attack their hive. That said, when bees do sting, it hurts a lot. Notice that even after the stinger is detached, zombie-like muscles keep digging and injecting that venom. The power of this tiny weapon comes not just from its potent venom, venom which can destroy human cells, but also from the stinger's surprisingly complex structure. Let's start out our tour by zooming in on the point of the spear. The end of a honeybee stinger is made of three parts. There is a stabilizing rod, technically called the stylus, and two digging blades called lancets. Each lancet is equipped with backward-facing barbs. Let's animate this image for you here. Those lancets slide on the stylus. Their movements are powered by the muscles left behind when a bee releases her stinger. The blades move back and forth in a saw-like motion. When a stinger enters your skin, each time a blade tugs up, those backward-facing barbs catch in your skin pulling the rest of the stinger down into your flesh. Alternating movements of each lancet allow the stinger to essentially walk further and further into your skin with each step of the lancet. Zooming out here, we see that the stylus, the stabilizing rod, it broadens to form a large, rigid venom bulb. If we peer through its surface, we see that attached to the shaft of each digging blade, each lancet, is a pump which fits inside that venom bulb. Above the bulb, there are muscles attached to plates of exoskeleton that power each lancet shaft. Every muscle pull simultaneously moves the lancet's digging blade and its accompanying pump. It automatically injects more venom every time it digs. It's a two-for-one deal. In this footage, we're looking at the stinger from a side view, and even though it's hard to see clearly through the bulb, the pumps are visible. You see that? Sitting on top of it all is a large venom sac and several glands that originally produced the venom in that sac. Now, at this point you might be wondering, if the shaft of the stinger is made of three parts, a stylus and two moving lancets, what stops the venom from leaking out at the seams? Shouldn't it spill out everywhere? How does venom only exit at the end of the stinger? Well, this is a cross-section of the stinger, as seen through an electron microscope. On the top here are the lancet shafts. On the bottom is the stylus, or what I've been calling the stabilizing rod. Now check this out. Each lancet moves along runners of the stylus. It's a tongue and groove system. That joint is tightly sealed shut. Here's what those runners look like if the lancets are removed. Furthermore, each lancet shaft has a curled, flexible latch connecting it to its companion. The latch on the right was damaged when this cross-section was made. I'll fix that here with some Photoshop magic. Altogether, these structures form a watertight, hypodermic needle, allowing venom to flow through the inner canal without leaking at any of the joints. Above the bulb, where the venom sac comes in, there are two swellings that function like zipper guides. These make up the venom bulb collar. This collar forces the two lancet shafts together as they move, sealing them shut down the midline. Here we are looking at a honeybee stinger from a slight side angle, again under an electron microscope. I'll color this black and white image to match our diagram. 
Here in green, we see the venom bulb. It's partly hidden by the structures surrounding it, so there's a dotted line there to show you what parts are hidden. Above that, we have the venom sac, then the lancet shafts in blue. And right here, those bulges, those make up the venom bulb collar. Zooming out, we can compare the diagram I've made to the real thing. The stinger of a honeybee, it's one of the most amazing weapons in nature. I would rank it above viper fangs, and I'd put it at least on par with the chameleon's tongue. Sadly, though, the honeybee stinger is far from perfect. The wound left behind in a bee's body after she stings, that will usually kill her. Her life is the price she pays to defend her hive. We'll learn exactly why that is in our next video. How did bee stingers evolve? And we'll also learn why it is that only female bees have stingers. Male bees cannot sting. Make sure that you're subscribed and you hit the bell icon if you don't want to miss that one. For now, though, let's just take a moment here to stop and appreciate what a fantastic contraption the stinger is. From a bee's perspective, you are Godzilla. In those films, Godzilla is impervious to our greatest weapons, yet the amount of pain a single bee can deliver with just one sting? Well, unless you're used to it, that's usually enough to ruin a person's day. On top of that, if you happen to be extremely allergic, which is super rare, mind you, I don't want to trigger a panic here, but if you do happen to be extremely allergic, a single sting can kill you. That is impressive. I am John Perry signing out. You have just watched How Do Bee Stingers Work? Stated Clearly.